given twice a day and at lower doses than what children got in the medication only group. So it's a comparison group to whatever community treatment there was. We were concerned that the variance would be so great because there would be a lot of variation in treatment that any comparison to that group statistically would be uh, problematic because the variance being larger would result in less significance. Uh, that didn't, wasn't the case. So our comparison group is still okay in terms of the variance, but it was treated but a different way. We, uh, we checked with pill counts, and then we had uh, initially weekly visits, and those were uh, double blind with, with uh, uh, 30 days, so we, we saw how many of the pills were actually punched out of the bubble pack. And then we had monthly visits after that. Uh, we did uh, checks with uh, saliva levels of methylphenidate during the first 14 months. So we do know a little bit about when you say you're taking medication, whether you're actually taking it or not. So they actually say they're taking medication sometimes when they're not. So it's a, uh, maybe even a, a slight overestimate of how many are on medication. But we don't, um, we don't have any other type of compliance. We didn't do a regular medication checks by uh, saliva levels, which would give you some indication whether the medication has been taken or not, or whether they're taking the dose prescribed. We do know there was a six-fold difference in dose across individuals, so we titrated. So there are some children had low and some to high doses. Um, the outcomes now are very interesting. Uh, about this time, there were publications saying that treatment of childhood ADHD with stimulants had a huge protective effect on substance use. That it reduced the risk for substance use if you treated children with stimulants during childhood. ADHD kids are at risk for substance use. Marijuana, alcohol, and that treatment reduces that risk. Psychologists say, well, you know, it doesn't affect any of the things that are usually associated with substance use, like peer interaction or other things. Why would it reduce? But we decided to look at it empirically. Brooke Molina and Bill Pelham were the leaders of this, and they still are. Uh, so the protective effects were claimed to be large. Some said there was a predisposing effect, and some animal work says that maybe you're, you're going to create some problem by giving <laughs> early treatment, and you'll make them more likely to abuse substances like uh, cocaine or other stimulants. And some found no association. What did we find? Here is the treatment uh, and uh, the use of substances, the percent of individuals reporting at 24, 36, 6 year, and 8 year. These color coded are a combined medication only behavioral and, and CC, which is the lowest? You may not be able to read that, but that's medication is the highest and behavioral is the lowest, even though there's not a significant difference except at one point right here. The rest are no significant differences. So actually, we didn't find any protective effect. Here are the, the ways we evaluated outcome. Alcohol, tobacco, marijuana, drugs, and, and uh, uh, definitions of abuse by DSM-4 criteria. And here are the, just the overall comparisons of ADHD to the controls. Yes, ADHD kids are at risk for substance use, so we documented that. This is MTA versus our, this is terminology now, the, the control group is the local normative control group. So with the, the comparison group now is merged in with the ADHD group. But these are classmates. And you can see that <coughs> there's early onset, <coughs> this case for marijuana use. And then marijuana use goes up in everybody as, with age. This is what teenagers do. It's not necessarily ADHD. So you have some diminution of the difference. But there, this is just what happens with, it, with uh, timing. Here's tobacco use, same thing. We're very interested in smoking behavior, which is one of the big health risks in the United States still, even though it's gone down tremendously over the last uh, several decades. Uh, uh, and uh, alcohol use, which is probably one of the biggest uh, problems uh, in many countries. Uh, early alcohol use, uh, unfortunately, when you go into college, most everybody drinks. 
So our, our control group doesn't differ much from ADHD group at a point in time when social factors are dealing with drinking, not, not biological factors. Uh, medication treatment is not associated with substance use or dependence. No effect of the original ra uh, randomly assigned groups, in other words, what you were assigned to get at eight years, with the one exception that if you got behavioral treatment at the three-year follow-up, you were less likely to abuse substances than if you didn't. And that's very different than what I think the consensus was. And there's no effect of current treatment or history of treatment. No effect either way. Doesn't, doesn't predispose you or it doesn't uh, make you more at risk in the MTA study. Now again, this, this is not what everybody finds, but this is, the, this is, I'm only reporting to you what we found in the MTA. Uh, of course, clinicians, I don't know how many clinicians are in the audience, First thing they say is, well, I'm not interested in a randomized clinical trial intent to treat analysis. I want to know what they actually got, because that's what clinicians do. They treat. And if you're not getting treated, you're not going to see the effect, even though we recommended the treatment. If you don't follow it, it's going to happen. Uh, the medication pattern over the first 14 months, behavioral treatment, about 25% were on medication when they came into the study. We took them off, and some refused to go off. So about 15% were still on medication. About 85% went on medication or higher on the med medication than combined groups. But then after the 14 months, this tends to converge. So the treatment in the community puts everybody into about the same level of treatment. So you might say, well, there's no long-term effect because the long-term treatment is merging and everybody's getting the same thing in the community. And that is true. So we are now evaluating this is, I love this table. I like tables and graphs. I like graphs more than tables. But this table is really good. Uh, here is the sign treatment. I'm not going to explain why we have 568, but this is just for another analysis. There's a reason for it, but it's too, too complicated. Uh, and this is the pattern of high medication use over time. Every time we see a person, we ask, how many days have you been treated since the last time we saw you? And if it's more than 50%, we say that's high use. That was what Peter Jensen and group, I'm part of the group, decided back when we published this a long time ago. So now we have the pattern of treatment over time. How many of the assessments were you reporting high medication use? We have seven assessments. Do you say you've been over, you've been using medication more than 50% of the days in between each one? That's always being treated at a high level. Do you say you never have been treated? That's never being treated with a high use. So we have never, going off and on, sometimes, or always. And then what's interesting is that the pattern of use over time is not independent of the assignment. What you were recommending to get determines what you're going to choose to do later in the MTA. Most of the people in the always group came from the medication and the combined group. These are just the percentages. About 9% of our patients, our subjects, were always treated. And I think that's pretty common what people find. Most children who are treated in childhood don't continue medication. In MTA, only 10% did. 25% never got treated with medication. And then there's 65% in the middle. How much was treated? Well, this is in the combined group, those who got always treated received over 10 years 121,875 milligrams of methylphenidate. So that's kind of the lifetime effect of, of that treatment. It's always being treated based on our qualitative assessment, but when we ask how many milligrams and what did you take and how often, we estimate over 100,000 milligrams. And these people who tried and then stopped, maybe less than you know, a couple of thousand milligrams, which is not much. And then people who start and stop, which is the common pattern, are about 50,000 milligrams lifetime or, or for the decade. Uh, and many of the people who uh, were at 14 months and also were for eight years, only 24%. Those who were on medication, most of them stopped. Those who weren't on medication at 14, most of them continued. 
and those who weren't and started, very few started. So this is another way of looking at this. And the reason I'm dwelling on this is that we wanted to know of those people that took medication, did they show protection against substance use? And we've done something called a propensity score analysis, which we also did in the 36-month follow-up. I won't describe that. But essentially what we try to do is form groups of those people who are like those who do use medication, but some of them didn't, versus those who are like those people who didn't use medication, and some of them did. And then we take those groups who are like the ones that did, and some did and some didn't, and those who like the ones that didn't use medication, and some did and some didn't, and compare those groups adjusting for those propensities to take medication to, you, to try to get around the fact that we don't have a randomized clinical trial. And this is, to me, a good, it's the best of what one can do when you don't have a randomized clinical trial. So we adjust for propensity to take medication, and then we see if there's any difference, and there isn't. So as much as, as, as close as we can tell, there is no protective effect, and there is no uh, uh, increase in risk associated with abuse by treating children with medication over the course of the MTA. We did that with uh, these three different analyses of primary and secondary outcome measures of abuse, number of substances, et cetera. So we don't find any effect. And the conclusion is that medication works. It works the next day, works the next month, it works the next year, maybe the second year. The relative benefit is going to be gone by about three years. So you give medication for what it does now rather than promising what it's going to do in the future based on the MTA results. And this is very different than what we thought when we uh, embarked on this study. But it, it, it certainly is a, a, a sound study. <clears throat> I, I quickly will just go through a few more things and then maybe allow, is it okay if I, I'll go to 4.15 and then allow 15 minutes for questions? I, I was supposed to stop five minutes ago, but I'll ask my host if I can continue. And if you let me go for another 10 minutes, I'll try to quickly go through the other topics. <clears throat> um, I know I'm trying to cover too much material. I thought I could do this, but uh, obviously I, I can't cover all the topics that I wanted to. Uh, but uh, let me just tell you, in the United States, uh, I was worried in 1995, and I wrote a letter to the editor of the New England Journal of Medicine saying, boy, there's been a big increase in medication from a million people up to maybe two million patients. The production of methylphenidate has gone from 1,700 kilograms up to 5,000 kilograms. <clears throat> there is a tracking mechanism that the World Health Organization or United Nations has of how much uh, medication, methylphenidate and amphetamine is produced in the world. And then it's tracked where it's exported and where it's used. So you could find how much, how much of your supply in Sweden has, how much the supply of stimulants has increased over the last couple of decades. I've actually done that for Sweden. I didn't bring the data, but I'll show you what I've done for the U.S. But I was worried, <clears throat> as was the, 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 uh, the FDA in, in the United States covers prescription medication, but the DEA covers diversion and misuse of medication. The DEA was worried that a lot of this increase was being diverted. And what this said is, no, it's not. The prescriptions account for the big increase in production. And my reasoning was, we're underdiagnosing ADHD. We're just catching up. Once we catch up, this production will level off and the number of prescriptions will level off and we'll be treating about 3% of the population or maybe up 5%. That was 1995. What's happened? Well, first of all, there have been very dramatic changes in the treatment with stimulant medication. Were there new medications? No. The only new ones that came around don't, don't get prescribed very much. The stimulants, amphetamine, wasn't used much in the United States until Adderall came on the market. It wasn't a new medication, it was just renamed. Immediate release methylphenidate is going up every year. And methyl, uh, amphetamine went up. Uh, both of those went down when the control release medications came on board in 2000, Concerta and then Adderall XR afterward. These took up as those go down, so the linear increase of 
number of prescriptions and supply of medication has been going on for decades. And 